Thank you for joining us in Finding God in Video Games. In today's Rewind, we're taking a look back at Viva Pinata and the dark side of this game. And, and you might say, what, what are you talking about? So here's the, the deal with Viva Pinata. I just, I couldn't do it. I knew the way to move forward in the game. The game's progress was contingent on my willingness to make sacrifices I simply couldn't bring myself to make. The cost was just too great. As I looked in the eyes of Little Wormy, despite what the game required, chose to decline the choice that was presented to me, and instead, I chose to simply stop playing. Now, that may need some context, so let me explain. Viva Pinata appears to be a cheerful, family-friendly gardening simulator. Now, appears is the operative word in that sentence. When we play it, we start out with a small, humble plot of land to begin our garden. And the first inhabitant of our little slice of heaven is a simple little worm. It lacks color, he has no home, and pretty easy to convince them to stay. He has pretty low expectations, you know, being a worm and all. And as we progress, we can build this little worm a home, so we can convince, you know, a second worm, build a little life together in their cheerful little homestead, name them, dress them up with cute little scarves. Eventually, worms will do what two little worms are going to do, and next thing you know, you have a whole happy family of worms living together in our garden paradise. So, so far, so good. Well, unfortunately, this is not what the game considers progression. Inside each of our little pinatas lies something very important, candy. Now that comes as a surprise, you know, pinatas of candy. But in order to access said candy, the pinata has to be broken. And that is a more violent process than I was prepared to endure, since, you know, it's a, a final thing for the pinata to endure. To get another type of pinata to come and stay in your garden, they first need to eat a pinata that currently lives there. For example, the bird will need to eat a worm. And my worms had not been bred for being eaten. They were a family with little names and outfits and such. But if I wanted to get to the next stage of the game, I had to accept that a moment of becoming broken was the price of admission. Now, in Psalm 51, we're going to, to look at a very visceral picture of the concept of brokenness. It's the story of David after his moral failure with Bathsheba. And David was, was very direct with his words when he was talking about this in Psalm 51, 16 and 17, speaking to the Lord, he said, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. David had to endure a, a painful season of becoming broken to advance to the next level with the Lord. Now his was due to a sin that he had committed. But as we'll find, this is not the only reason we encounter times of being broken in our walk with God. Indeed, the act of being broken is a prerequisite to the final stages of fulfilling one's destiny in multiple occasions. I mean, Job is probably the most exceptional you know, example of brokenness when he cried out to the Lord in his suffering through all of his trials when he lost his children, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his home. All of these horrible things happened to him and he was broken beyond measure, having done nothing to deserve it. The prophets like Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, each of them faced painful broken periods in which they begged the Lord for death, release, or at least a reprieve from the journey that they were on. But the fruit that they contained within them would only be exposed once they had been broken on the potter's will. Now, I know what you're thinking. All right, well, that all sounds really good. That's a bunch of Old Testament stuff. All right, so let's take up the most famous and well-known case of brokenness. It comes to us from our Lord and Savior himself, Christ Jesus. Now, this is a verse that's typically utilized whenever people you know, partake of communion. And it's where we read that his body was broken for us as a means of saving us. It's 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. It's Paul speaking. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I was also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Brokenness is not only the path, it's actually the destination. It is where Jesus fulfilled his destiny and accomplished his purpose on this earth. No matter how we got where we are right now, whether it was through sin, like David, 
work through obedience and, and innocence like Job. It is the path to and through the broken place that the critical parts of us that are inside are broken and spilled out in a way that brings others to the garden. Now, fortunately for all of us, our Heavenly Father loves us enough to lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. He, not, he knows not only what we can endure, He also knows our true breaking point and what reaching that point will yield. And as He gathers exactly who will need the unique candy that our brokenness will generate, He'll make sure they are there at the perfect time in our lives. So let's not hide from the stick that is going to threaten to break our pinata open. Let's endure it. It is at the apex of our shatter point that we can truly feed those around us who are in need. We'll finish with a reading from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. We are pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Perplexed, yet not to despair. Pursued, yet not forsaken. Struck down, yet not destroyed.